his fear of the coronavirus harming people with other medical conditions. Joining us for our Your Health segment tonight are Mark Vesely, an interventional cardiologist with the University of Maryland Medical Center and an associate professor of medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, and Jeremy Pollack, a cardiologist at the University of Maryland St. Joseph Medical Center. Doctors, thanks to both of you for being with us. Dr. Pollack, if I can begin with you, it's been reported around the country there are people with symptoms of other medical conditions, say it's uh, your appendix, appendicitis, who are delaying seeking treatment because of fear that if they go to the hospital, they're gonna catch the coronavirus. In your practice, are, are you seeing anything like that? You know, Jeff, first and foremost, thanks for uh, having me on. And it's a pleasure to be on with Dr. Vesely. Um, and sorry, we have to do this afar like this. So thanks for having us. And your question is a really good one, an apropos one. Uh, something we've seen as collateral damage from COVID is patients not seeking timely and appropriate care. I'm covering the hospital wards at St. Joseph's right behind me. And every day I've seen patients presenting days, hours, weeks later than they should for heart attacks. And we have a saying in cardiology that time is muscle. So every minute, every hour you delay, you lessen your chance of a good outcome, of leaving the hospital with a good outcome. And it, it's important you're having us on, Jeff, because both Mark and I are here to report back to you guys and to Marylanders across the state that St. Joseph's University of Maryland as a system is here. We're ready, willing, and able to take care of you with or without COVID. Dr. Vesely, you, uh, you run a cath lab where, where heart attack patients are, are treated uh, initially. Have you seen anything in your work along those lines? Absolutely. Absolutely, Jeff. I agree with what Dr. Pollock has said uh, tremendously. We've had patients, uh, and as you mentioned, across the state and across the country coming in uh, with, with delayed uh, presentations, having had symptoms for a while. That fear is something that's very important uh, to get over. Uh, I think it's important that we recognize as patients uh, that uh, our systems have had weeks and weeks to prepare and continue to prepare uh, to receive patients both with COVID-19 and with the same medical issues that we had six months ago, heart attacks and strokes, appendicitis, all of these things are critically important that people reach out and, and you hear over and over again of patients coming in uh, and, and talking about delaying because of this fear. So what are the, the safeguards that are in place in either of your hospitals? Somebody walking in the door at the emergency department, how, how is that handled? So, so we've a, had uh, time ahead, to... Okay, so we've had plenty of time now to develop both infrastructure and our physical plant, the way that the, the patients are handled and, and kind of taken through an emergency room visit, uh, as well as throughout the hospital to uh, really make it as safe as possible, both for the patients as well as our healthcare provider team to limit the chances of exposure of people with COVID-19 to uh, people without COVID-19 and to do very rapid screening and try to separate those people. So walking into the emergency room, you should expect to very quickly be screened for uh, potential symptoms related to COVID-19 and then taken down pathways, uh, both physically and structurally within the healthcare teams uh, to manage uh, each person's individual problems as best we can. Always a good idea to review what, what those symptoms are, whether it's a stroke or, or a heart attack of some kind, and especially because the, the symptoms can differ between individuals, between men and women. Dr. Pollack, what sort of symptoms do you not want somebody waiting on? You know, the, the classic heart attack symptoms that we teach patients are sudden onset chest pain. Now, not everyone says chest pain. It's a discomfort that can be in the middle of your chest. It's a tugging. It's a pressure. Um, it can be associated with shortness of breath, with nausea, with sweating, with just not feeling right. Sometimes it can be an impending sense of doom. Things that you normally don't feel that come on suddenly, these are all things that you have to recognize and call and seek help right away. Let me uh, remind our viewers, if you have a question about uh, the heart, about the coronavirus and the intersection of those, give us a call. We'll have the number up on the screen. You can also send your questions to our email address, which is livequestions at mpt.org. So, uh, Dr. Vesely, the coronavirus itself the intersection of that and, and people who have heart issues, maybe somebody you've placed a stent 
Uh, we know there's a, a clotting issue in some people with the coronavirus. W what should they be alert to? Well, a couple different reasons uh, to be concerned about the blood clots. And again, you see blood clot issues in manifesting in heart attacks as well as in stroke patients as well. Uh, and we know that people uh, who have a predisposed or pr a prior history of heart disease have an increased uh, risk of getting very sick with uh, COVID-19. Uh, so we are very careful as we uh, approach these uh, patients. If someone comes in with a heart attack, some of the EKG changes that we're finding are a little bit different than what they were, say, six months ago when COVID-19 wasn't around. And some patients look like they're very much having a heart attack, uh, but they may not be. Their heart is still affected by that, and we need to uh, see those patients very quickly. Uh, so it's a little bit of a challenge for us at times, but we're getting through that as best we can and, and figuring out things as, as we go with cath lab tests and other things to, to take patients through. Let's uh, take a phone call. This is Anita. Anita's calling from West Virginia. Anita, thanks for the call. Go ahead. Yes, hello. I know there's still so much that needs to be learned about the coronavirus and how it spreads. My concern is if you're around people who are smoking uh, either tobacco cigarettes or those e-cigarettes, can the virus be, if that person has the virus, can the virus be transmitted by breathing that secondhand smoke or the vapors from those e-cigarettes? Great topic. Uh, thank you very much for the phone call. Doctors, either of you? I mean, I think that's uh, the first thing you have to uh, say with that. It's a great question. Thanks for calling in from West Virginia. Um, is You shouldn't be smoking to begin with, regardless of COVID. So there's seven traditional thick risk factors for the development of coronary disease, and smoking is one of the biggest ones. So please, please, please don't smoke. And then your question, I think, is regarding the aerosolization of COVID. Now, I am not an infectious disease specialist. I'm a cardiologist. Um, but I would say that we just all have to abide by the CDC recommendations, the state and uh, country recommendations of staying six feet apart. And I, I do think it is prudent to stay away from people that are smoking. You know, I would add on to that, these term. masks that we're wearing. I'm sorry. Please. I, I would Mark just add on that the masks yep. that we're wearing at this point are to help prevent that aerosolization. And if you're close enough to be worried about secondhand smoke that people have floating around them, then you're probably too close to, uh, you know, to also be uh, potentially exposed to the, to the virus. So keep wearing the masks Absolutely. and keep that distance. I was going to ask about some of the maybe longer range factors uh, at the moment. One is just everybody's stress level. You know, even even if you don't think you're affected by this, uh, everybody's life has, has been changed. Whether you, you work in a hospital, you're a first responder, you have nothing to do with it. Uh, the, the level of stress is there. The second point I was going to make is when you when you go to the grocery store, if you go out shopping, there, there's this feeling of of. Um, Maybe it's part of the stress that you're lucky to find stuff. You know, there's toilet paper. Yay. Uh, so when it comes to food, you're maybe grabbing the Twinkies and, and forgetting about the things that you had been meaning to do with your diet. So, Dr. Pollack, how, how do you think about all that? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, it started out as a uh, holiday without any of the fun for the first week or two. And now we're in week nine or 10 and we're all finding that uh, we're violating the first three risk factors for heart disease, which are the fountain of youth with diet, exercise and weight loss. So we're all having the COVID-19 turn into the COVID-20. So it's uh, as important as it to recognize signs of a heart attack. It's also important to recognize the things that can cause it long term. So this is the time sun's coming out. It's warm to get moving again, to eat better, to try to lose that weight that you gained over the last uh, eight to ten weeks because it's really really important and that's how you avoid having to come to the hospital and have to meet Dr. Vesely and I. Let's take a call from uh, Prince George's County. This is Diane. Diane, thanks for calling. Go ahead. Um, good afternoon. I have a question. If someone's been diagnosed as having fluid around the heart, does that make the person more at risk for serious complications if they contract the virus? Let's ask Dr. Vesely. Thank you for the phone call. So there hasn't been any direct correlation of fluid around the heart with a particular more severe case of COVID-19 or an increased risk of picking it up. I would say anecdotally, not with any kind of published randomized trials or 
other observational studies, but I do feel like there are a fair number of people coming in with COVID-19 who have that fluid collecting around the heart. Sometimes that fluid, if it accumulates very rapidly, can lead to pressures on the heart. We need to drain that quickly with a needle. Uh, it's actually not that invasive of a procedure as much as it sounds uh, pretty uh, pretty ugly. Uh, but it's something that we, we watch for very carefully in the hospital. And, and fluid around the heart particularly is not something uh, that should chase you off the other messages here of, of paying attention to other symptoms like chest discomfort and shortness of breath. Let's take a call from Fairfax County. This is Paul. Uh, Paul, thanks for calling. Go ahead. Yes, thank you for being there. Is there something we can do from home when we start to have symptoms to be proactive to try to get as much treatment as possible from home so that we can avoid having to go to the hospital and, and, and have all of those difficult treatments. Some providers may not be that proactive. If you have somebody with lung susceptibility, maybe early use of steroids, maybe early use of some oxygen, is what can we do from home to give us the best chance of not needing to go to the hospital? Paul, let me, let, before you go, you're, you're talking coronavirus symptoms, not cardiac symptoms, right? Absolutely, coronavirus, okay. you start to get symptoms, but you, you don't want to just wait and you don't want to just go to the hospital. Do, you know, should you push for steroids? Should you push for an uh, inhaler? Should you push for oxygen? What can you do Let me, from uh, a home setting? Thanks for the phone call. We have two cardiologists with us. So do either of you want to uh, add anything to that? I think it's I mean, important. Sure, absolutely. To... Go ahead, Jeremy. All right, Mark, thanks. Um, yeah, I, the, to address both COVID and non-COVID symptoms, Paul, so it's a great question, and we want to keep patients at home as much as possible. And so now with there was waiver 1135, which CMS and the payers just enacted about seven weeks ago that allow us as physicians to provide care virtually. So we all have, for the most part, cell phones that have video cameras on it. So now when I'm in the outpatient setting, I'm seeing my patients via FaceTime or via video conferencing application. So if you're having symptoms, whether or not it's COVID symptoms or you think it's cardiac symptoms, you can access me. You can access our primary care doctors at St. Joe's at University of Maryland. You can access our specialists via virtual visits where we can help you assess the risks and benefits, benefits, listen to your symptoms and decide, hey, what are the tests that you need? Do you need to come to the hospital or is this something that we can delay and see you in a few weeks? Dr. Vesely, did you want to add to that? I think Dr. Pollack hit the hit the nail on the head there. Uh, there are hotlines, and they're established uh, through both of our centers. That if you struggle to reach out to your other uh, established doctors, or you just need help, uh, you should reach out to us. And you can find us through our websites and things to to reach out. Uh, so rather than sitting on things uh, and and just waiting, uh, call out for help. Yeah, Dr. Pollack, uh, on the subject of of. Uh, being in your profession and having to do an appointment virtually, you can't take their blood pressure, you can't look at them. Um, how much of a handicap is, is that for the, for the doctor? You can't take vitals. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it's a paradigm shift for all of us, but you can do 95% of the visit virtually. Um, most patients have a blood pressure cuff that gives you what their blood pressure is in the moment, what their pulse is. A lot of patients have pulse oximeters at home. You can actually visually see a patient. I can get a lot of the physical exam just by having them move the video camera and then listening to the patient. Uh, you, Dr. Vesely is one of my mentors and it's something that we're taught as we're in training is the history, actually hearing what the patient has to say is 90 to 95% of the battle. So we can do a lot of this without physically having you present in front of us. So it's very important to recognize this, that you don't always have to access the emergency room. You can access us from the primary care or specialist setting in a virtual sense. All right. I, I just have half a minute. Uh, Dr. Vesely, let, let's end with some, some bottom line advice here. From cardiologist standpoint, what are the things that you don't want somebody ignoring today because they're afraid of, of coming to a hospital? 
So uh, the classic symptoms, again, for a heart attack are chest discomfort, whether it being pressure or a squeezing sensation or other type of pain associated with shortness of breath, sometimes very heavy sweating, uh, being nauseated or busy, being dizzy. Those are the main symptoms to look out for a heart attack. For a stroke, a nice acronym to kind of point to is called FAST. F is for a facial droop. Uh, a would be for arm weakness. S would be for any kind of new slurred speech. Uh, and T for time. Remember that time is muscle and time is brain and reach out for that help. Very good. Dr. Mark Vesely, Dr. Jeremy Pollack of the University of Maryland Medical System. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Your health segments are a co-production of Maryland Public Television and the University of Maryland Medical System. 